and uh, Joao is uh, coming from uh, Baltimore, where he spent most of his professional life at, life at Johns Hopkins University. And before that, he was at uh, Penn in uh, Philadelphia. And before that, he was in Brazil. And actually, uh, comes from the most beautiful city in Brazil called Salvador Bahia. Those who weren't there, go there. <laughs> and he's um, currently a professor of uh, medicine and radiology and heads the uh, cardiovascular imaging uh, section uh, there. And his expertise is really in um, MRI mostly and imaging scars. And I remember the work he you've done with, uh, I think it was in uh, strong collaboration with biomedical engineering and estimating scar size from, from MRI images, right? Okay. So without further ado, thank you for coming to join us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I should say that uh, uh, I'm honored and uh, to be here, but especially for the meetings I had throughout the day, uh, being exposed to uh, the fascinating work that you're doing here is quite a privilege. And I had a, I had a ball. I mean, uh, I've met you and uh, Yoda, and we have several points of, uh, of connection. Yoda was from Technion, and I was at Technion for a few months. Uh, but one thing had been striking to me is, as a Brazilian, um, everybody loves Rio much more than everybody else, than everywhere else. So to have somebody who told me right in the first meeting, I like Bahia better than Rio. I said, ah, oh, he's, he's a genius. <laughs> and it, it, it reflects. Uh, you know, our own local parochial uh, really is more beautiful, but by is better. Um, I'm going to try to tell you here a story about uh, how um, imaging, uh, I learned that tremendously, I'm not an electrophysiologist, I just became very interested in imaging uh, the scar. Uh, along the, the way, and particularly with the goal towards um, imaging the substrate of uh, ventricular arrhythmias. So that's where um, I intersected with uh, uh, many of your interests. Um, the problem is sudden death, as you know, quantify the, the number of people who die suddenly in the United States is, is a big challenge. It's clearly not less than 250,000, and uh, probably is not uh, 500,000, 700,000, as some people believe at one point. In, in, in any way, it's, it's uh, too many, way, way, uh, is, a, is a huge public health uh, problem, uh, compounded by the fact that the best way we have to fix the problem or to prevent it is so expensive. and. Uh, uh, unreliable in many ways. Only 5% of people a year gets uh, gets shocked at appropriately. So um, we as a society need, need to find better ways to uh, risk stratify and understand this problem so we can prevent it as opposed to treat the manifesting uh, cases. And uh, I heard some amazing presentations today about uh, rare causes, genetic causes, how localized they are, fascinating work. Um, and most of, of um, and it's very, uh, uh, it, it will be very important for us as we understand the pathophysiology of sudden death. But as we have it now, most cases come from individuals that develop or uh, some sort of structural heart disease, uh, be it a cardiomyopathy, what we call cardiomyopathy, generalized <coughs> processes, being local damage, 
caused by different causes, uh, caused by, by different uh, ide ideologies, coronary artery disease being the most frequent one. I tend to, um, so it's an attempt to characterize this, this uh, substrate, uh, the substrate and imaging of course lends itself to it that I'm going to be concentrating uh, my remarks here, particularly on fibrosis as the substrate. I, I like to classify fibrosis into uh, those that result from infiltrative disease, and those I'm not going to be talking much about it because they are rare. Uh, it's likely that amyloidosis is not a rare, as rare as we think, but uh, I'm going to be concentrating on replacement fibrosis, and then, then I'm going to talk about interstitial fibrosis. Not because we have a link to sudden death yet, or ventricular arrhythmias that has been very well documented, but because I would like to provoke you um, on, on perhaps um, thinking of uh, ways to, uh, uh, so half uh, of, of ways of understanding if there is a link, probably there is in the atrium, as we discussed with Dr. Schuller, that, that uh, uh, link is probably more evident in the ventricle. I'll be waiting for what uh, this institution and uh, other groups uh, produce to, to find that link. The link with replacement fibrosis is pretty well established. So replacement fibrosis quantified by gadolinium delayed enhancement, contrast enhanced MR, and interstitial fibrosis by Q1 mapping virtually more than half of what I'm going to say is relates to replacement fibrosis, but I will be talking to you about interstitial fibrosis, how to quantify it. Um, this is uh, the most recent paper by Raymond Kwan's group in Boston at the, at the Brigham, showing that uh, if uh, uh, the majority of people who have sudden cardiac arrest have a um, uh, identifiable scar in the heart by gadolinium delayed enhancement, and actually if you follow those with scar, those without scar, the ones with scar have worse prognosis, and I guess that cutoff point was 8% of the ventricle was, was the cutoff point for worse prognosis. Uh, most of what was first developed, and we, we played some role on um, defining the scar by contrast enhanced MR. As you can see here, this is an aneurysm, a well-formed aneurysm. So it was done in the setting of coronary artery disease, ischemic cardiomyopathy, the classic ischemic cardiomyopathy. Here is, you have uh, a very typical case of the times when imports were mostly non reperfused So a transmural infarct, you see a thrombus layered against that scar, and you see that the the connections between the scar and the wall are complex um, because the scar needs to be anchored in the ventricular wall because the stresses are not trivial at that border zone. But if you look as we develop the field, and when I say we, I say about multiplicity of labs and people that became involved in, in this development, which is now a preclinical standard, and that's what I'm going to be talking about here. What has being translated to the clinical world, you have the, the typical ischemic pa pattern, which is either transmural or endocardial, but you have the pattern that is associated with dilated cardiomyopathies. Generally, it's uh, middle of the wall. Sometimes we see that in ischemic heart disease, but it's mostly non ischemic. The subepicardial one is almost pathognomonic of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. You don't see that on ischemic heart disease, and then you can have focal scar, and focal scar can be uh, due to embolization, um, it can be due to local damage by uh, a myriad of processes. Kathy Wu, who has been um, uh, a pioneer on this in our, in our team, relating sca scar patterns to sudden death uh, showed very clearly that in dilated non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, these patterns all exist. So um, 
any of these patterns can be seen with dilated cardiomyopathies that are non ischemic with proven uh, low coronary artery disease on cath and was associated with a worse prognosis than if you didn't have a scar. <coughs> this is similar to what Rick Wong has shown uh, more recently. Um, and uh, for all people who have an arrest. And I'm going to be showing you some Kaplan-Meier curves. Um, and uh, please don't get tired of them. And if you do, raise your hand and I'll speed up. Um, and more recently, also, in dilated cardiomyopathies, the group in England uh, who has been focusing on that pattern right in the middle of the wall, so in the center, uh, they've asked a question, is that pattern more ominous than all the patterns? And they clearly believe so. And they have shown that that pattern associates with badness, all-cause mortality, uh, cardiovascular mortality, heart failure, but for the purpose of this presentation, sudden cardiac death or uh, uh, an appropriate firing. So that pattern is particularly uh, ominous for, for this. I'm sorry that um, the incremental prognosis is seen on a curve that doesn't project well, so you're not going to be seen. Um, but for sudden cardiac death is basically an incremental uh, level of this line in relation to this one with a, a wider confidence interval than for the other ones because the events are less. Um, so there is not only a relationship, but it's, there is incremental value. They showed in patients who perished from this process that this is due to fibrosis and that the delayed enhancement does correspond to fibrosis. And uh, uh, very early on, Simon Azari and our group had uh, wondered that this particular type sitting right in the middle of the wall was particularly bad in terms of prognosis. And uh, now, uh, in discussions with Saman, with Frank Marchelinski, several other leaders in the field, the question, and the group in England, the question is if this creates an isolation of the subendocardium and subepicardial uh, layers of the wall, and uh, therefore, it's particularly bad. Uh, or what would be the other mechanisms we can certainly open to uh, hear your thoughts, but we find uh, uh, correlates in the earlier literature that wondered in non ischemic cardiomyopathy that the mechanisms were uh, that when scar is in the middle of the wall, deep, uh, or separating the two, uh, two halves of the wall, that is particularly ominous, and uh, that correlated well by MRI. Um, the other, so localization of the scar um, and the strategic position of the scar seems to be important on the uh, on generating uh, malignant ventricular rhythm. Uh, the other situation is um, the situation that in my mind is exemplified by um, sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis um, has now a very straightforward translation that if you have a lot of fibrosis by magnetic resonance, it, you are generally treated much more aggressively for, for those who take care of uh, patients with sarcoidosis, to the point of implanting a cardiovascular defibrillator uh, at a much lower level of, uh, 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 of demonstrated risk than in other conditions. Now it's not, it's believed with very good reason, this is a recent paper by the UC group, that in sarcoidosis, by the way, for those present either as something that looks like a tumor in the septum, or it can present with any of those enhancement patterns I've shown you here, uh, like a spinocardial infarct, a transmural infarct. It, it can look just like that. Um, or it can look, like I said, like a tumor and if it enhances a lot like this, um, generally people are quite aggressive, particularly if anti-inflammatory therapy doesn't reduce it dramatically. Um, the prognosis of those who have 
uh, the scar is uh, 20 times higher. So um, it's pretty well uh, demonstrated that this is a, a marker of, uh, of, of problems. But there is also in the heart of everyone involved, in, in particularly with this patient group, that inflammation is patients are particularly prone to reentrant or to malignant arrhythmias when they are in a crisis of sarcoidosis. And treatment for sarcoidosis generally appeases uh, that uh, those uh, recalcitrant uh, VT cycles. But if you have the combination of fibrosis with uh, uh, scar that appears, or fibrosis with inflammation, like with myocarditis, that appears to be a very important combination in terms of uh, overrhythmias. So, uh, and you see this in patients who have been diagnosed with uh, myocarditis, the usual viral myocarditis, like in the case of this boy um, who got a defibrillator because of uh, the of, of incessant VT. And then the other poster child condition for this association between fibrosis and inflammation is uh, Chagas heart disease. And uh, uh, I used to think, because I come originally from Brazil, and where Chagas heart disease is endemic, um, that every time that I'm thinking that something looks like Chagas here in the US, I think of sarcoidosis, because the syndromes are so similar. So, uh, even though the distribution of scar is generally not exactly the same, although I've seen patients with sarcoidosis with the typical apical scar that is uh, the hallmark of Chagas heart disease. So um, in medical school, um, I remember the, the case of this uh, young man that used to wash cars and sort of take care of the cars parked at the university hospital and was found by one of the cars in an autopsy um, since I was in pathology at that time when he had was an apical aneurysm. So that event itself probably played a role in me going into cardiology, but um, also uh, brings how, how uh, important this is as a marker of people who uh, die suddenly because of this condition. And uh, the other site is the infralateral wall, which is not very common by sarcoidosis. Uh, sarcoidosis, but it can be affected. I've seen patients, uh, involves a lot of the septum, um, as in that case, and is also a blotchy. But Carlos Rashid showed very clearly that the more fibrosis you have, it means you are progressing in the Chagas heart disease spectrum. Um, and he showed that inflammation uh, by using our T2 uh, MRI techniques, he showed in this side here, you see signs of inflammation connected with, uh, uh, with scar in patients who actually uh, only had EKG changes, uh, no LV dysfunction, but are evidently at risk for arrhythmias. The other group of diseases were this, the knowledge of SCAR by a more has translated to uh, the clinical setting in a controversial way is in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. As you know, if you have very thick septum, if you have a history of uh, sudden death or sudden death in a family member that has um, hokum, then uh, you get it from later. Um, but, um, that's how the guidelines uh, are written at the present time. But there is a lot of debate with the fact that uh, there is a lot of evidence showing that if you have a lot of uh, scar by MRI, that uh, you should be treated uh, aggressively as well. Now, how, what aggressive means? But this is a very good review of the, uh, of the status of uh, uh, scar imaging uh, so replacement fibrosis imaging in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And in this study, um, the authors suggest 15% as being the threshold 
um, that you should act on. Uh, it's interesting how it's not in the guidelines, but everybody's using it. So in our institution, more than 15% generally gets a lot of attention and uh, uh, close to get <coughs> a defibrillator implanted. And uh, uh, that's, uh, or at least there is discussion if, if one has uh, more than 15% of, uh, of scar. Uh, the, uh, the role that SCAR plays in uh, sudden death in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is, is quite interesting because, as you know, the, uh, the fibrosis uh, is generally situated in areas where uh, the fibers are in disarray, so they appear to be associated with the genetic, uh, the genetic problem. And there is also data from Jennifer Ho, published a few years before, that in carriers of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, indices of fibrosis, biomarkers of fibrosis are elevated even before people develop hypertrophy, which raises the question, in that genetic condition, does hypertrophy bring hypertrophy or fibrosis or fibrosis precedes hypertrophy, which is something we'll talk a little more uh, at the end. But traditionally, and uh, Jorn uh, and I were talking about, uh, I was telling him that I had met Dr. Wellens once at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I actually, UPenn was in the middle of my, I trained at Hopkins and then my first job was uh, at UPenn. And I'm saying this because it's related a little bit to the SCAR, um, taking SCAR out to cure, uh, to cure uh, ventricular tachycardia. I got uh, hired at Penn after a big argument with Mark Josephson that VT came from the border, not from, um, and he, of course, he was right. Uh, he showed me that there were several uh, cases where they had taken uh, this area here out. Uh, but by the time I got back to Hopkins, I had a letter offering me a job uh, because Mark likes discussions. I didn't know that. But <laughs> I thought that I, you know, I come to uh, for a job interview and I go into an argument with the chief cardiology about where VT comes from, and uh, but that actually was quite good, uh, and uh, uh, we, you know, I still uh, used to very good friends and we talked about it last year when we got together at the BI, but. Uh, the traditional thought that uh, in the scar, in the border of transmural scars, you can have these circuits that will generate VT. Uh, Let us, uh, in the beginning of the year 2000, to uh, look at the possibility that we could quantify that by MRI. And this work was led by Kathy Wu. Uh, Andres Schmidt worked with, with Kathy. And uh, she created this concept that we call the gray zone. Uh, why gray zone? Just because it looked gray on the MRI image. There's nothing. Uh, so uh, an area where instead of a dense scar, you have a, a scar that is mixed with viable tissue and um, uh, forming, therefore, a very good substrate uh, for uh, arrhythmia. And uh, she showed very early that uh, uh, if you had a lot of this mixed tissue, you are at much greater risk to have inducibility in the lab. This was uh, uh, the thrust for the Reynolds. This study was funded. This whole effort was funded by the Reynolds Foundation and was the original effort. Uh, the group at the Brigham took that concept and since they were using the same vendor, they used the same software, um, they chose different cutoff point um, than, the, than we had, but they showed that actually it had prognostic significance as well. And uh, uh, if you had larger gray zones for the same size of scar, your prognosis was worse. So um, even though 
uh, that paradigm was shown uh, in the uh, in ischemic heart disease. Uh, we don't use the size of the gray zone or the size of the very heart zone to make clinical decisions yet, at least. I think um, once we are able to make maps uh, as detailed as the ones generated here, um, we probably might get into the situation where we could correlate uh, the two parameters and make clinical decisions about it, but it's still uh, a little too, uh, uh, too far from that. This is the work of Hiroshi Ashikaga from our group. And it also showed very clearly in some of his examples exactly what Mark Josephson was arguing in that debate we had that led to my hiring at UPenn, that uh, uh, in a scar that looks dense, you may have channels that go through the scar and therefore form a uh, re-entry circle, and that uh, might be the origin of uh, tachycardia. Today, I had a, discuss a discussion with Phil um, uh, in the in the in the hospital uh, about patients that he is ablating, um, and uh, uh, based on and, and it's fascinating that uh, this might be able to be done in such uh, elegant and non-invasive way. So where does this uh, where is this going? Again, under the leadership of Kathy Wu, who got together with Natalia Trayanova, who is somebody who came from partially from here, because she spent some time here, is very proud of uh, having spent time here uh, after Katrina, uh, and very thankful. Um, Kathy and Natalia teamed up and, and asked me really for, for help with the imaging part uh, because uh, we are working on this project uh, that are called A Heart Like Mine. So based on the imaging phenotype, if you find a heart just like that, that has the electrical properties uh, that, uh, uh, that map, uh, mapped with the capabilities that would be uh, by ECBI, for example, you could perhaps um, do a non-invasive um, uh, stimulation protocol and guess if that patient um, is, is uh, uh, likely to have sudden cardiac death or not based on, that, on those findings. So th the rationale for this is that uh, what we use today, as we discussed earlier, is uh, is inadequate from a societal standpoint because we identify people and have uh, uh, our risk stratification is very rough in the sense that we have to put a lot of place, a lot of AICDs to uh, 20 AICDs to save one life, and this is very constant. And you are very familiar with that, so I'm going to go through this uh, uh, in a, in a uh, faster way. Um, but there is an electric and a mechanical component to, uh, to her model. The assumptions is that if one uses that, one could uh, uh, reduce costs and improve patient identification and uh, determine susceptibility for arrhythmia through um, a, a non-invasive electrophysiology simulation test. And uh, we are gathering data to demonstrate that this is the case. Um, and uh, this is a very exciting uh, area. And I'm particularly committed to develop imaging technologies that would uh, allow mapping of ventricular arrhythmias with more detail than we have uh, because the electrical mapping uh, that uh, has been done here has been developed here and uh, has a, a, 
a resolution such that it would benefit from greater resolution from, <coughs> from uh, uh, image. There is also the idea uh, of uh, uh, including Bharat and Bali, Venkatesh, who um, is uh, in our department of radiology and works very closely with us and is a, a, a specialist in machine learning. So the idea here would be to use data from recordings of uh, ECGs uh, and uh, to inform the combination of uh, imaging and simulation. That's what Barat's role would be. And uh, that's where I think, where we would like to take the replacement fibrosis paradigm. Now let's talk a little bit about um, the interstitial fibrosis. Um, as you know, interstitial fibrosis is generally secondary to the most common diseases that we have in the cardiovascular. They're becoming more common, actually, as the epidemiology of heart disease is changing. What we are seeing is that uh, diabetes and hypertension are becoming uh, the main causes of coronary artery disease in some, in some way substitution to the traditional risk factors that we uh, generally consider like LDL um, and uh, uh, smoking. Uh, so the traditional risk factors established in the Framingham study related both to North Atlantic type of uh, coronary artery disease patterns in the world is partially being substituted by uh, hypertension, diabetes. And if you went to China, for example, um, a glucose level has the same power as LDL in defining who, uh, who is at risk for, for an MI. So the epidemiology uh, of this disease seems to be shifting. And therefore, um, the conditions that cause interstitial fibrosis have become more, uh, more prevalent. Years ago, we, uh, we published this formula, which was actually already being used by a lot of people, including in Higgins. Uh, Charles Higgins is a friend and a radiologist in UCSF. And uh, we were already using the formula that we use now to do T1 mapping, or MOLLE maps. Um, the issue was that we didn't have the spatial resolution. Uh, we couldn't do a map of T1 at a voxel level at that time. We had to have chunks of, uh, of tissue to be able to say something about their fibrosis content just by looking at the time course of GAD in the tissue versus the blood and creating a relationship, and of course, uh, multiplying by the plasma volume. That is a very simple formula <coughs> for the extracellular volume, and uh, we used that in this publication so many years ago. Uh, here's a picture of interstitial fibrosis. Uh, this is a normal heart, and this is uh, a heart with interstitial fibrosis. So. Uh, it comes not because you lost myocyte <coughs> and you're now replaced by a scar. It comes from the enlargement of the <coughs> extracellular space and accumulation of uh, collagen and uh, uh, matrix or extra matrix. And uh, uh, is that important? Well, let's see what uh, knowledge we have by using a uh, population study is it important in the in the uh, uh, in the general population? We know that if we measure fibrosis, interstitial fibrosis, this way in different conditions like hypertrophic cardiac myopathy um, and uh, uh, many other conditions, you uh, amyloidosis, uh, infiltrative <coughs> disorders, you're going to have interstitial fibrosis that is very different from normals. But we asked the question of, what if you do it in a population? 
uh, here's the experiment, the typical experiment. Uh, when I did, the, I was in training and I did this actually, uh, was, you know, you had to do it, put a, a chunk of tissue in the magnet and spend the night. Um, very much like you guys would working on structural biology here, uh, work at night and uh, we, because each of these points would take like 20 minutes to get. So we would do this spin echo to get this value here, and then uh, inject GAD, and then the T1 shortens remarkably um, of, of the tissue, and then you image again until you measure it again until that recovery uh, comes back. Um, what this method of T1 mapping brought up was the possibility of do this with just like 11 heartbeats, in this case I think 17 heartbeats. That's, yes, that's what we use in Beza. Uh, but there are, uh, there are pulse sequences now uh, that use even less. So uh, you create then a T1 value for each of these voxels and that's a remarkable technological development that I, I never thought. It, it is important to see that apparently this got developed in, in different labs, but what happened at Hopkins and was not developed by us, but it was prompted by the looking for a reference tissue for characterizing delayed enhancement. And I think we were talking um, uh, about how difficult this is in the atrium find a spot that is your reference that is not fibrosed, um, that was at Hopkins what drove the, uh, it was in the GE engineering group that was cited with us at the time, Tan Fu. Uh, we were basically harassing Tan Fu about how to m get a reference for the gray zone. Um, what is remote and go find a a place automatically um, that would be the reference so that we could measure fibrosis. And then somebody had the idea, well, let's measure T1 directly. And uh, we didn't think that was possible, but Tom actually thought it could be. And uh, that was one of the efforts that led to this. Uh, so we applied actually a different methodology created by Daniel Sergley. Uh, it's called Molly, and that's the, because on the full version, we didn't have uh, the early uh, simulation of the curve. Uh, we would miss this part, and therefore get only, the curve was, was sort of curved. MESA involves six sites, uh, 7,000 people, age 45 to 84, half women, and an important part of MESA is that people with heart disease, previous heart disease, was excluded. The results of this, this was decided in Chicago in 1999 in a meeting, a heated meeting about uh, what was the focus of MESA. We didn't have an idea of the consequences of, of doing this. So what happens in MESA is that this population is a little healthier than any other population and uh, uh, in prospective studies in the U.S. So if you compare with ERIC, with CHS, with Framingham, uh, MESA is a little healthier because we excluded uh, in the different age groups people who had had events. So you have a population that is, you know, imagine this Gauss curve that is now going to move throughout time, but is a little healthier. This is something to have in mind. Here's the map of MESA. CT core lab is here. The MRI core lab is at Hopkins. And the recruiting sites are uh, Wake Forest, Hopkins, uh, Columbia, Northwestern, UCLA, and Minnesota. This, the coordinating center is in Seattle. And uh, we have the blood bank is at Vermont. It's a very nice collaborative group. Uh, We've done five exams. Actually, we're, in September, we're going to start the sixth. 
The sex is going to be concentrated on brain, the relationship between cardiovascular and, uh, and brain alterations, because now the cohort is, is older and the main issue is cognitive function. And But it, that would be a lot of, we're going to measure, for example, atrial fibrillation um, in the whole cohort. And uh, uh, it should be it should be an interesting. Uh, the surveillance also entails at every nine months, everybody gets a phone call about events. Uh, this was uh, the protocol that was used in Meza, uh, pre-contrast uh, at 12 minutes and then at 25 minutes. And Chao Lu was the physicist who led this uh, uh, this effort. We calculated a partition coefficient based on um, the drop in T1 after you give contrast. So that is would be pre-contrast 12 and 25 minutes. And then we use the same formula. If you multiply this by the plasma volume, you have the extracellular volume. And then there was a surprise. Uh, my uh, interstitial fibrosis is greater in women than in men in postmenopausal. Uh, now we had an IMESA, any cardiovascular risk factor that was greater in women than in men. So this uh, raised some eyebrows from the very beginning. And we were wondering if this had to do with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We are going to get there. We don't have a proof that it does. Uh, but we did look at uh, what was the impact of interstitial fibrosis in remodeling. This is the work of Barat. And Barat showed that the more interstitial fibrosis you have, um, your, if, if, and he looked at longitudinally, not only cross-sectionally at the exam five, but he looked from exam one to exam five, so 10 years, in 10 years, um, you have a, in those who had more fibrosis in exam 5, there was a decrease in the mass and a decrease in the volume of the ventricle. So the ventricle became smaller and the mass became less. And the same relationships were seen across different age groups in the cross-sectional study. That was very helpful because it provided credence to the longitudinal um, data. And uh, so what it looks like fibrosis, uh, myocardial fibrosis contributes to uh, is to the generation of this phenotype of concentric remodeling that seems to be what we do in life if we are successful, <coughs> that is, if we live long. Uh, this is now the work of John Eng, who is one of uh, my colleagues in, in radiology and worked with us uh, because this needed, we used a different pulse sequence at baseline, at the beginning of each of these arrow here is MESA1, and at the end is MESA5. So it's the left ventricular volume for each of these age groups uh, in uh, the baseline exam and the 10 years later, and that's for men in blue, for women in red. And what you can see that all of us tend to uh, have a reduction in the volume of our hearts. So as we get older, our hearts get smaller. Um, and this was across the four ethnicities of Mesa, in Caucasians, African Americans, Chinese Americans, and Latin Americans. The same thing happened in men and women, as you can see. Uh, so that seems to be uh, pretty reproducible uh, phenotype or alteration that we undergo uh, in, through, uh, through aging. And uh, it seems to be related to interstitial fibrosis. Now, if you take the mass of the ventricle and divide by the volume, um, you can see that there is an incredible increase. So uh, we call this concentric remodeling. So what the heart does as one gets older is to remodel concentrically. And what we see in terms of physiology is a reduction in the systolic volume and in systolic volume. 
therefore a reduction in the stroke volume, but because the mass increases in relative terms, the ejection fraction actually stays the same. Um, so the goal of the remodeling process is to keep ejection fraction the same uh, while the ventricle uh, suffers quite a reduction in the ability of generate uh, uh, stroke volume. And this phenotype uh, is associated with events, uh, particularly if it's developed early in life. So in patients with uh, um, in patients with renal disease, in patients that develop this phenotype earlier in life, uh, the chances of events are particularly uh, increased in the, in the MESA study and in other, uh, in other studies. So that's, as, as I, in MESA we don't have enough sudden cardiac events to relate this interstitial fibrosis phenotype to sudden cardiac death. But that's something that this is probably the institution and the team that could, uh, that could uh, answer that question. I would like to finish by mentioning that uh, uh, Pierre Laclade, who founded St. Louis, also gave its name to a little town in Missouri, northern Missouri. This was his house. Uh, uh, this is the house of, of uh, Pershing. John Pershing was born in this place. We don't call it Laclade, we, we call it Laclede, Laclede, Missouri. Um, it has about 400 people. I was a foreign exchange student in this little town for one whole year <laughs> and uh, went to school in the neighboring town because it was too small to have a high school. I uh, had a great school. Uh, it was a fantastic experience. Uh, and uh, uh, I still have a lot of connections with, uh, with the folks I stayed with. But uh, therefore, there is a, a, a direct connection. So I came first to St. Louis, uh, where people from La Clean was very proud that uh, Pierre Laclade had been uh, the founder of St. Louis and uh, gave the name to, to uh, our little town there. Uh, in conclusion, uh, that's how I didactically see fibrosis, um, and uh, that phenotype has a direct relationship with sudden death. Uh, this one, not really, that, uh, that we know of, uh, not a specific direct connection. Uh, interstitial fibrosis, I don't think, we have enough evidence to say yes or no. Uh, we're going to need more involvement from uh, the young people here to tease out uh, whether that excess incidence of sudden death is coming from uh, that relationship. I try to make the case that uh, fibrosis is <coughs> an important pathway. Uh, like the brain apparently um, ages by depositing amyloid. The liver uh, can become fibrotic or can accumulate fat. The cardiovascular system pretty much develops this fibrosis, uh, this deposition of uh, matrix in the extracellular space that changes the material properties of the heart vessels and uh, is apparently related to uh, reduction in LV volume. Now, replacement fibrosis is clearly associated with malignant arrhythmias. Inflammation is clearly an important uh, added factor to that. And uh, I would like to thank Kathy Wu uh, because, and this is Carlos Rashid, there were about in my lab at the same time, and uh, Kathy continues to be our leader in the ventricular arrhythmia. This is the lab now, and since I showed the work of Bharat Ambali, uh, here he is. And uh, in MESA, my main collaborator has been for many years, David Blanke, 
who uh, was the director of MRI at Hopkins and now the head of uh, radiology at NIH, and remains uh, very connected with us. I showed you also the work of Chalu, and I can only thank you for your patience for Yes, I am uh, very much interested in, I, I wasn't aware of this phenomenon, the volume going down the vein. I have a couple questions. Do you normalize that for body weight? Because some of us seem to go up in body weight as we get older. <laughs> <laughs> I, was just I was just wondering if, you know, I've always correlated body weight with, you know, heart size. And, 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 and is that normalized or how do you yeah. control that? That is normalized for, uh, for body weight. Okay. Um, if you don't normalize, actually, the relationship is even more striking. Um, but um, that is, and when I say the end diastolic volume is normalized, the concentric remodeling uh, is not normalized for body weight because both LV volume and LV mass um, would be affected the right. same way, so that cancels out. So that's a relationship between LV volume and LV mass in the end. But the endostatic volume is really And it's the second question I have is you showed that going down in the data range in your patients, which was what, from 60s to 80s, or what was the? From 45 to 45 84. To yeah. So, so is this a lifetime thing that it goes down, or is there some sort of curve that goes up for a while and it comes down? That's a great question, because uh, we are dealing here, for example, with women, uh, postmenopause, right? Uh, right. So this is a relationship that that increase in, in extracellular space is is seen in postmenopausal women. Do we see this in premenopausal women? Um, most of the data that we have is that up to age 40, you don't see that. That this becomes uh, apparently after uh, age 35 to 45. That's when fibrosis appears to be uh, a factor. Now, we don't have large populations um, that had MRI with contrast in people that were that young. So what we have there is uh, these studies that we've done and everybody has done. You take everybody in the lab and put it in the magnet uh, and see. Uh, in, in in those young people, you don't see a relationship of women have more uh, interstitial fibrosis than men. So you're saying you start to go downhill at 45? Well, I show the women. I show the work of, of uh, Nathan Mutin, but um, in fact, this is more like the idea here is to show that this boundary could be have could be in mind as we think of preventive, uh, of how, how to prevent cardiovascular disease, because in fact we live much longer than that, right? right yeah. We live much longer, um, you know, uh, the survival in uh, industrialized countries are in the 70s, so there is um, nothing that, that uh, but if you take survival of humans before the industrial revolution, that was the average, 35 to 40. Um, so, you know, there's people that argue as well. Uh, we basically developed ways to uh, not let that boundary really uh, define survival for us, but it does look like it defines some parameters of limitation in, in cardiovascular diseases. So we, we ought to be aware of, uh, of those trends. Well, I have a question. You know, we recently started looking at uh, hookum patients, kind of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. And um, we've looked at a couple of different uh, methods of determining what tissue is abnormal and what is not. In other words, people have looked at um, full width half maximum and then also six standard deviations, but they all reference uh, normal myocardium. And so when you look at some Hocum patients, it's, it's obvious there are very fixed areas of, of enhancement and fibrosis. Other Hocum patients, you look at it and there's nothing is normal. You know, in other words, there is. <laughs> so the problem then you have is depending upon what slice, you know, so, some patients are getting very consistent, you know, you have uh, normal and, and but 
but on, depending upon the slice you pick, uh, it varies. The so numbers. right, and so then you end up. I mean, at least we end up sort of eyeballing it and going, well, you know, if I if I fudge this a little bit, this looks more like thirty percent than ten percent, that type of thing. Or I, because it's so abnormal, I'm only getting that two percent is abnormal. What I really think it's more like, you know, fifty percent. So how do you how do you handle that? Uh, that's you know, actually. <laughs> When I'm not the only one then, huh? No, no, no. This comes from the full width with half max uh, work that Luciano Malu was actually um, uh, one that uh, that was his his work in the lab faced this problem right up front. The question of where to define what was remote, right? To be able to uh, uh, in experimental animals that that's what he was doing. This was even uh, easier because you cause an infarct and uh, the, the animal doesn't really have a history or doesn't have heart disease in, in the past. So you're comparing damaged tissue to... But in cases of uh, disease, particularly human disease, years of development, that becomes very hard to... Uh, and, and that's why the T1 uh, <coughs> method I think was developed. Uh, now, can you use T1 to define uh, areas of dense fibrosis and use T1 to, to you know, determine what is abnormal? Um, yes, there has been a couple of, uh, of studies from Cedar sinai um, was the, the best ones, using T1 mapping to define the area of, uh, uh, of replacement fibrosis as opposed to gadolinium delayed enhancement. Uh, when you have to use gadolinium delayed enhancement, there is this margin. We adjust it visually too. That's what we do. And uh, this becomes particularly challenging if you're measuring uh, different patients. Uh, if you're measuring the same patient over time, it becomes a little easier because you choose the reference to stay the same. Uh, but it's the, the Achilles heel of uh, determining the gray zone, determining the tissue mix by delayed enhancement. It's, you're not alone. <laughs> I wonder if you can say something about the substrate in, in the air we see. And is that a little different than interstitial fibrosis? There's a lot of fatty infiltration. And I don't know enough about the MRI story there, just peripherally, but maybe you, you can tell us more about MRI in the RBC. Um, I took all the slides out of the, <laughs> all the ARBC slides out because I thought, you know, like you said, it's different. And uh, therefore, um, it was a whole, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the precision fibrosis um, because I don't know the, the, its relationship. Now, with the ARVC, um, there are changes that are very similar to uh, the other cardiomyopathies in that you have fibrosis, but that doesn't appear to be even the main process. That appears to be the downstream process because if you look at us that don't have ARVC, uh, we can have fat accumulation in infarcts because fibroblasts degenerate into adipocytes. So if, if you have an infarct that is two years old, you can have fat. And actually, you, you have a lot of that in human infarcts. Um, in ARVC, that degeneration appears to happen immediately. So as the cell dies, um, whatever fibroblasts or whatever replacement comes along appears to entail uh, fat degeneration, fat accumulation. So you have up front a very different uh, genetically determined uh, uh, process. And it helps from a diagnostic standpoint because fat infiltration in the middle of the myocardium does happen. In MESA we had, uh, in MESA 5 we had three or four people that had fat infiltration and we couldn't determine anything wrong with them. Um, it was generally at the apex. Um, the group at the NIH has a collection of these cases. 
of people that are referred there and they don't have a RVD, do they have a different form of uh, cardiomyopathy that, um, but anyway, they didn't behave as a RVD? Uh, well, the RVC patient, uh, it's a disease of the decimal zone. You have a gap junction and coupling between cells. So at the microscopic cell level, it's very different. It's a very different. And at the macroscopic level, um, there are some features of uh, all the cardiomyopathies, but it's also quite different, particularly in terms of uh, fat infiltration and distribution. Uh, now, we also have identified people that have ARVD, but genetically don't have a RVD, and I'm sure Jeffrey Tobin has published a lot on this um, that he thinks is a, it's a conglomerate of conditions, uh, ARVD being the most frequent one. Uh, and do you have any experience uh, of MRI findings in the RVC? Yes. Um, I find that uh, Dave Blanke published uh, with Harry Tendry, one of our electrophysiologists, that the most sensitive signs are signs mm -hmm. of localized dysfunction in the RV. And it's true, if the RV is scalloped in contraction, you generally associate that. So RV dilatation with regional dysfunction is the most common finding. But the most specific finding is fat deposited in the myocardium, particularly in outside the RV. If you have a combination of RV with LV uh, fat deposition, um, that's really suggestive of, uh, of ARVD. Is CT good for that? Very good. CT is excellent to uh, diagnose uh, fat infiltration. And we've seen patients that had an AICD and were not primarily identified as having ARVD. But when you look at the CT, it's pretty clear that that's, that's what they have. Um, and uh, so the diagnosis was done sort of retrospectively. They got an ACD because they had sudden death, and uh, it, it was treated that way. So that's, uh, in a way, it's pretty different than the other cardiomyopathies. Um, the, are we doing anything that makes the scars different? That's another question that uh, we, we have pondered. There have been reports that ARBs do modify scars and that uh, perhaps induce fat degeneration in, in scars. So, um, but those are reports that if we don't see a systematic, uh, as a systematic finding. We can't look at an MRI and say, this person is taking ARBs or, uh, and I don't think even those observations have been confirmed beyond doubt. It's a suspicion. So CT is, just to understand, CT is better than MRI for ARBC diagnosis? Uh, CT is uh, very good at, I'm not sure it's better than MRI, maybe it is better to identify fat specifically. Fat in the myocardium is is very easily identified by CT because you can put the Hounsfield unit marker, measure how much it is, and be sure that that's fat. Um, by MR, it's also easy. You just have to do a uh, an extra step of image, and then image again suppressing uh, the fat peak, uh, and then demonstrating that that area is indeed fat. That's what you have to do, but you have to be alert for that and uh, have that specific question in mind. Uh, Good question. For this immigrant key, uh, the scar size, the, the, you know, the, some reports say, uh, suggest that the large scar size predictor the mortality. So do we have uh, any existing criteria to define large scar media scar, transmural scar, or something like that, basically, on energy? That, 
what appears to me is what's important in schematic score is a tap dead or a, a trade-off between if the score is very large and there is a lot of a hemodynamic stress being put particularly in the border zones, um, then you have um, an increased substrate for, for VT, particularly if you have a lot of mixing in the border zone. If, um, if the attachment is quite clean um, in these patients, you generally don't see, you will see people that dies of heart failure without ever having any arrhythmia. What is a large scar? A large scar is an infarct that is greater than 15%. 30% uh, is very large. Remember, 40% is about cardiogenic shock, and people generally doesn't survive that. So most of large infarcts are between 18 and, and, uh, and 28. Uh, less than five is very small. And uh, uh, in MESA, in the general population, um, about 8% uh, of people have SCAR. Uh, half of them were clearly associated with skin heart disease. Uh, half of them, so 4% skin heart disease, 4% non-ischemic pattern. Um, and generally, um, you know, the, the volume between 5 and 10% in, uh, in people who, who have SCAR. Uh, particularly if it was unassociated with any clinical events. That gives you an... Uh, now, what is also apparent is that if the SCAR is very modeled, very mixed, that that entails a greater risk for ischemic heart disease, for, for arrhythmias. Um, it behaves a little bit like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where you see a lot of mixing, and uh, particularly in the septum, and they tend to, to have a lot of arrhythmia. Just a quick technical question. Uh, in John Hawking, how do you, uh, you measure ECV? At which time point do you uh, decide? Because you measure 15, 20, 25 minutes, yeah, here's the, 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 the thing is that ECV is excellent at separating. So take, take MESA, people who have SCAR, they have greater ECV than, than the people who are normal. You know, when you try to measure across the spectrum, then ECV is less useful than if you're comparing diseased people with normal people. Um, we generally measure ECV from three times point, three, 12, 25, but that's arbitrary. Just to construct that, um, that partition coefficient curve, a lot of people actually use this four points. Um, the, the guys at the Brigham, our friends, our colleagues at the Brigham, uh, tend to use more points than we do. Um, Michael. Michael yeah, yeah. yeah. That's. Uh, uh, I think Michael likes four or five points, um, but you know, generally we were measuring in a thousand people, so we had to be a little more conservative. How many times we, we thought people could do this in different centers, um, and that works. It appears to be. now of the post contrast indices. Interestingly enough, the ones who relate the most with risk factors, the 25 minutes. It's the ugliest image, but it's the one that uh, relates to uh, cardiovascular risk factors uh, in the strongest way. Pre-contrast was not related uh, in, in the general population. Anyway. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you.